Well, there's a, there's a movie back in 2007 called The Bucket List. It had Jack Nicholson, Morgan Freeman, and um, the basic premise of the movie is, is that these guys are dying, and they don't want to die in an old person's home, so they, they sneak out. And then the movie is about them kind of doing the things they always wanted to do before they breathe their last breath. And so that, that bucket list mentality, it's like, what are the things that you want to do before you die? All right, the bucket list. Now, there's a Tim McGraw song um, where he, he talks about like being 40 years old, getting some x-rays back, and he finds out that his life is, is going to be short-lived, and he says, what do you do with news like that? And then the song goes, I went skydiving, Rocky Mountain climbing, I went 2.7 seconds on a bull named Fu Manchu, right? Like, like we get this idea, like, like man, what would, so think about this. If you're like, hey, I, I know life's going to end soon, like, what would your bucket list be, okay? Well, with that same kind of thought, what I want us to think about is, is if you knew that Jesus was coming back tomorrow, what would change about your life today? I mean, if, you, if you truly believe like Jesus was going to show back up tomorrow, the trumpet sound, he returns, what would be different about your life today? And so that's, that's kind of the question I want us to wrestle with as we look at Revelation chapter 22 today. If Jesus was coming back tomorrow, how would your life look different today? Okay, so we're going to pick up in Revelation 22, verses 6 through 21. Now, Revelation has been a hard book to get through. Today is not a hard sermon. I love it. It ends like on the best note ever. This is going to be a super simple, everyone can get it sermon. So if you're like, Jeff, Revelation's too hard, not today. All right. So let's look at, I want to show you guys three things that should change about our lives if we truly believe that Jesus would come back tomorrow. So look at verse six. And he said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. This is an angel speaking to John. And the Lord, the God of the spirits, of the prophets has sent his angel to show his servant what must soon take place. And verse seven says, and behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. So just take note of that word, behold, and the statement, I am coming soon, okay? Um, and, then, and then look at, so, so what we see here is the statement that Jesus is coming soon. What I wanna point out is that one is this is not wishful thinking. I think a lot of times when we're like, man, Jesus is coming back, we can approach it like it's wishful thinking. But the way that Bible talks about the hope that we have, like in 1 Peter, it talks about our hope is a living hope, is, is like it's not wishful thinking. For instance, how many of you guys um, were like basketball fans and your school didn't make it? All right, like maybe you're an Auburn fan and you're like, what happened? Maybe you're a Kentucky fan. What happened? Maybe you're like a Texas Tech fan and NC State comes out of nowhere. You're like, what in the world? Who's this, who is this aircraft carrier? But all to say, like I had wishful thinking that my team would win March Madness. Wishful thinking. I hoped it. It didn't come true. That's not the way that we approach um, the statement that Jesus is coming soon. But there's another way of thinking about hope. Uh, but we've compared it be like this before. It's like a tailwind with an airplane. Let's say that you're, you're, you've got a flight and you need to make it to, to Charlotte so you can connect to Tri-Cities. And as you're getting ready to go on that flight, you're on the runway and it's delayed and it's delayed and it's delayed. And you're sitting there going, I'm not going to make it. Like, I'm not going to make my connection flight. This is going to be bad. I'm going to have to rent a car. I'm going to have to stay at the airport overnight. Whatever it is, you're sitting there going, ah. But then the pilot comes on the intercom, and he says, you guys were a little bit late, but we're going to make up time because there's a tailwind, right? All of a sudden, like, that hope of making it on time isn't wishful thinking because it's based on a reality, and so when we think about Jesus returning, this is not wishful thinking. Instead, this is what we would say is confident expectation, right? So we don't have wishful thinking for Jesus' second coming. This is something that we have confident expectation because it's based on a reality, all right? That Jesus is who he said he is, all right? So Jesus gives a statement, I'm coming soon, and we know that this is not wishful thinking. It's a promise, right? And so this promise begins with the word, behold, right? And so what he's saying with that word behold is fix your gaze. So he's saying, fix your gaze on this reality. Think about this reality. Set your heart on this reality in such a way that your life begins to reorient around it. So fix your gaze on this truth. Jesus is coming soon, right? And if we really believe that, what would change in our lives? Three things. Let's look at the first thing, verses eight through nine. 
I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. All right, so, so John, he's just amazed by what he has seen in all the visions of Revelation. His response is to fall down and worship this angel who's a messenger. The angel's like, whoa, 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 don't, don't do that. That is, that is wrong. Don't, don't worship me. I'm a fellow servant. Worship God. And so that shows us the first thing that our life should be reoriented around. If we truly believe that Jesus is coming back, we should spend our lives in worship, okay? Now, there's so many things I could talk about when it comes to worship. I mean, the truth is, is we were created to worship. The truth is, is we are all worshipers. It's just a a question of like, what do we worship, right? Or who do we worship? But what I want us to see today or to, to think about is that what Revelation shows us as we're reading this book is that there is one reality, God's reality, but there are two realms. There is a physical realm that we can see, and there is a spiritual realm that we cannot see. And what Revelation has done is it has peeled back the curtain and shown us that in the spiritual realm, there is a war that is being waged against God and his people. So what you have to understand is that life is a battle, that life is a, is a spiritual war that we are in. And what I want you to know, why it's so important for us to, to worship, right, until Jesus comes again, is because worship is how we fight this battle. I mean, I love it. In Second Chronicles, there's a story of Jehoshaphat, okay? Jehoshaphat is ruling Israel, and while he is ruling, all these opposing armies start to crush in on them, right? So on God's people, these opposing armies are marching in. Defeat seems imminent, but then God tells them, like, the battle plan. He's like, I want you guys to, to, to praise and worship me. And so it says in verse 22 that as they begin to sing and praise that God ambushed the opposing armies and brought about victory for God's people, right? And so so a strange battle plan, but it shows us this reality that, that there is a battle happening. And one of the ways that we experience victory in the battles of life is to spend our lives in worship. So we want to be people who are worshiping God. I, mean, I love the psalmist says that God lives and dwells in our praises. Think about that. God lives and dwells in our praises, which means that as we worship, the invisible God is doing invisible and powerful things that are, that are for, our, for our well-being, that are, that are on our behalf, that are for our victory. So if we believe Jesus is coming back, right, we need to be people who are worshiping. If we're going to make it through this life until he comes back, we need to be people who spend our lives in worship. So the first thing is, if Jesus is coming back, we should be people who worship. Let's keep going. Verse 10. And he said to me, Do not seal up the words of this prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the evildoer still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and sorcerers and the sexual immoral um, and the murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Right, there's, there's a lot going on in these verses, but I want to point out is that these verses show us that there are two types of people in the world. All right, two types. There are people who don't believe Jesus is who he said he was and they don't believe Jesus is coming back, and there are people who do, right? There there, there are people who don't believe in Jesus, and there are people who do believe in Jesus. And what we see here in these verses, is specifically verse 11, is that what you believe about Jesus affects the way you live, right? So what you believe affects the way you live. I think about it like this. When I was a kid, Real young, um, my my whole family, like my grandparents, aunts, uncles, they all live in the mountains of eastern Kentucky, and it's scary back there. All right, and so when I was a kid, my grandpa used to tell me a story. Um, so that so they had their house across the street was a general store that that my grandparents ran, and my grandpa told me in those mountains behind the store lives Red Swamp Bloody Bones. 
And he'd tell this story that just jacked me up as a kid. Like, so as a kid, I was like, Red Swamp Bloody Bones lives in those mountains. And so at the general store, there was a Coke machine out front. And at night, sometimes I would take my 50 cents and I would walk across the street to get my Coke, right? So imagine that here's, here's like fourth grade Jeff walking just confidently, but internally, I'm freaking out. And I put in, I put in my 50 cents, I hit the button, it comes out. And when I turn around and the mountains are behind me, do you know what I did? I sprinted. I was like, oh, like, I would just like sprint back until I got to the porch. Like, oh, okay. Because I believed in Red Swamp Bloody Bones, it affected the way that I lived, right? Like, like I responded to that. But as I got older, I realized that this guy isn't real. This is a story that my grandpa made up to scare me. And so, and so when I started to believe that he wasn't real, guess what happened? Like, I no longer had fear in Kentucky right? At least not for Red Swamp Bloody Bones, right? So, so like I no longer had fear because I didn't believe. And so, so in the same way we see here is if you don't believe in Jesus, like you're not going to live your life in light of that reality. But if you do believe in Jesus, it's going to affect the way that you live. And so what we see in verse 11 is that if you don't believe that Jesus is who he said he was, and you don't believe that Jesus will return, you're going to continue to do what God sees as evil, right? That means that you're going to continue to do what you want, when you want, with whoever you want, with no thought of God whatsoever. And God calls that evil. That is what we call sin. And so if you don't believe in Jesus, you're going to continue to live in sin. But if you do believe in Jesus, it says, it says, um, and so it says, the righteous will still do right and the holy will still be holy, which means if you do believe in Jesus' second coming, you're going to pursue Christ's likeness. So this brings us to the second thing. The first thing is if we believe Jesus is coming back, we should be people who worship. The second thing is if we believe Jesus is coming back, we should walk with Jesus or pursue holiness, right? We should do what is right. We should seek holiness. So if we believe Jesus is coming again, we should seek holiness. We should spend our lives walking with Jesus. So let me say something here, okay? The goal of Christianity isn't just to get to Jesus when you die. It's also to get Christ's likeness into you now as you live, okay? Let me say that again. The goal isn't just to get to Jesus when you die. It's to get Christ's likeness into you now as you live. And so what we have to understand is that as people, we don't naturally drift towards holiness. We drift towards worldliness. Therefore, on a daily basis, we should seek to be transformed. And if we're not seeking that transformation, we're going to find ourselves being conformed to an image of the world. All right. So for us, what we need to do is we need to ask ourselves, what does Christ's likeness look in the different areas of my life? And so as, as if we truly believe that Jesus will return, we should walk with Jesus. And what does it look like to walk with Jesus? It's saying, what does Christ's likeness look like in education? What does Christ's likeness look like in my vocation? What does Christ's likeness look like in my marriage? What does Christ's likeness look like in my, my parenting? And so whatever area of life you're in, there is a way to apply Christ's likeness to it. And so if we really believe Jesus is coming back, we should walk with Jesus. We should pursue holiness, which means we should try to seek to live as Christ would live if he were in our shoes. So the first thing is we want to worship. The second thing is we want to walk with Jesus. Look at verse 16. It says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star, the spirit and the bride, you know, the, the spirit and the bride, the bride is the church. If you remember from a couple of weeks ago, the spirit and the bride of the church say, come and let the one who hears say, come and let the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. Okay. So, so as we've read Revelation, we've seen different voices. We've heard the voice of John. We've heard the voice of Jesus. We've heard the voice of an angel. And now we're hearing the voice of of the Holy Spirit and the bride. And the reason these voices are combined is because this is a message from the Holy Spirit that is meant to be delivered through the church, 
right? So the reason these voices are combined, the, the Holy Spirit and the bride, is because it's a message from the Holy Spirit that is meant to be delivered through the church. And so, so what is the message? The message is to come, okay? So this brings us to the third thing. The first thing is to worship. The second thing is to walk with Jesus, to give us a third W. The third thing is witness, all right? Witness or invite others to come to Jesus. We should spend our lives witnessing and inviting others to come to Jesus. You see, until the day that Jesus returns, our mission is to invite all who are thirsty for something more than this world has to offer to come to Jesus because only he can satisfy the deepest longings of our hearts. And so everyone you meet has this, this, this heart-level longing for things like purpose, for relationship, for meaning, for fulfillment. Like every human being, that's what it means to be human to an extent, is that you have these heart, these depth, like deep heart longings. What you have to understand, and what we have to understand, is that as people long for these things, only Jesus can satisfy. And there's a famous quote by, by C.S. Lewis where he says, if I find myself with a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. Like, I love that. Let me, let me read that again. If I find myself with a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. And if you keep reading, this is a mere Christianity. Eventually he says, the main object of my life is to press on towards that world and help others do the same. All right, and so, so if we truly believe that Jesus is going to return, we should spend our lives witnessing and inviting others to come to know Christ like we know Christ. All right, and so, so we want to worship. We want to walk with Jesus. We want to witness. All right, so, so what's the big idea? Well, look at verse 20, all right? It says, he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. All right, what we see here is in the last verses of the last chapter of the last book of the Bible is that three times it says Jesus is coming soon. Jesus will return, right? That's the big idea today. Jesus is coming back. The problem, though, is I feel like so many of us don't believe this truth in such a way that our lives reflect it, right? We might, we might intellectually believe it, but do we believe it in such a way that we are living out lives of worship, of walking with Jesus and witnessing, inviting others to come to him? And I would say, I don't think a lot of us do. And I think the reason we struggle to believe this is because of that word soon, Right? You read that word soon, you're going, soon in 2,000 years seems a little bit off. And so, like, so if he hasn't come for 2,000 years, like, why should I live like he's coming back tomorrow? Because it's been 2,000 years. And so there's a couple of explanations here of what people think is going on. Um, one thought is that soon means quickly which is not talking about when Jesus will return, but how he will return. That when he comes back at a time that we don't know, he's going to do so quickly. That it's not going to be this long, drawn-out process. It's just going to be like, bam, he's back and he's established his new heaven and new earth. All right, so that, that's one option. Um, another option is in 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter tells us that, that what, what to us is a thousand years, to God is like a single day, right? And so from God's perspective, what he sees as soon, and from our perspective, what we see as soon are two different things. And at the end of the day, like, this is God's timeline, not ours, right? And so, so I, I lean towards that Second Peter 3 of what soon means, that just like for us, yeah, a thousand years. But to God, a thousand years is a day, right? So, so we want to understand that Jesus is coming back, and we want to live in such a way that we say, I truly believe it, right? And so what do we do with Jesus' final words? Well, I, I love it. Like, um, Jesus doesn't just double down, he triples down, right? He doesn't just double down. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. He's like three times, I'm coming soon. Why does he triple down, okay? Well, think about it like this. There, when it comes to my, my son, right, he is, he is more short-sighted than long-sighted when it comes to life. And so right now, he is in this, this Bojangles kick. Like he loves 
Bojangles. It's like he every day is like, Dad, I'm hungry. I'm like, what do you want? He's like, Bojangles. Right? And so he wants Bojangles every day. And, and so we'll go get him some Bojangles, the kid's meal, like two Supremes and a biscuit and some fries, and, and he loves it. Right? But that adds up. Like, it's a kid's meal, but it still costs money. And so, so one day, we're driving home from baseball practice. He's like, Dad, I'm so hungry. I was like, I was like you want some Taco Bell? He's like, no. You want Chick-fil-A? No. I'm, I'm naming it. And he's like, you want some Bojangles? Yeah. Right? Like, he, I'm like, like, look, buddy, like, this is getting expensive. I was like, so, so we can either eat Bojangles today, right, or we can take that money and put it away. And we can save up that money, and over the course of time, we'll have enough money to go to the beach with our whole family this summer. And so, would you rather go to the beach this summer or have Bojangles now? And guess what he wants? Bojangles, right? Short-sighted, not long-sighted, okay? In the same way, for us, many of us live with a temporal mindset instead of, instead of an eternal mindset. And so, what, what Revelation is doing all of Revelation, all of, the, all of the visions, all of the prophecies, all of the imagery, all of Revelation is pulling our hearts away from short-sighted concerns and ambitions, and it's pulling our hearts towards a reorientation where we begin to live like we actually believe what Jesus says. So all of Revelation, it's, it's reorienting our lives and saying, like, how, how do we live not just with a short-sighted mindset, but with, a, with an eternal mindset? Like, how do we live with eternity in mind? So Revelation is prepping our hearts for that. Look, let me wrap up with this. Revelation has been hard. All right, this has been a hard book to get through. Right? And so you might be thinking, Jeff, why did we spend 17 weeks cranking through this book? right? We could have done just like two sermon series on the seven churches, called it a day, and moved on to something else. Like every week we're coming in, we're wrestling with this, we're, we're giving our best. The reason why, um, the reason why I wanted to push us to go through the whole book is because in chapter one, verse three, it says that revelation is a blessing, right? To read and to hear and to keep the words of this prophecy is not meant to scare us into heaven, it's meant to encourage us to faithfully follow Christ in a fallen world, but it's also meant to be a blessing for God's people. And so for me, I'm like, man, like, I, if this is meant to be a blessing, I don't want our church to miss it, right? Like it takes the whole Bible to create whole Christians, so we're gonna keep going through hard books, right? But if it's meant to be a blessing, I don't wanna miss it. So if, if to hear and to keep these words results in our being blessed, what does it look like for us to hear and to keep these words? I would say that the response, the, the goal of Revelation, like going through this, wasn't for us to nail down the best interpretation or to pick our camp. The goal was us, for us to be a church that is blessed. And so whatever your stance is on Revelation, for us to hear and to keep these words looks like those three things. If we want to experience the blessing of Revelation, we want to, to let the imagery, the prophecies, the visions pull our hearts towards Christ in such a way that we spend our days in worship, that we spend our days walking with Jesus, and that we spend our days witnessing and inviting others to come. And if you will do those three things, right, you will hear and you will apply the words of revelation. And if you will do those things, you will experience the blessing that God has for you. God, thank you for your word. As we have worked through this book, God, I know that you've been present with every page of Scripture. God, that you, you've taken imperfect thoughts and incomplete thoughts and confusing things, and, and you, you've worked them into our hearts that, that we are primed and prepped to be blessed by you. And so, Father, I ask that you would help us to be a people who truly believe with confident expectation that you are coming soon. And God, as we truly believe that, help our hearts to be reoriented, that we would spend our lives worshiping. God, help us to be people who worship, not just on Sunday mornings, but in our jobs, in our homes, in our neighborhoods. God, let everything be worship. God, let us spend our lives walking with you, walking with Jesus and, and thinking and doing the work of, of experiencing life transformation. And God, help us to witness. God, our friends, our families, our coworkers, our neighbors, they have these deep, 
heart longings for things that only you can satisfy. And so, God, let us, let us invite others to come to Jesus as well. So, Father, help us to be a people who live in light of your truth, specifically your second coming. It's in your holy name that we pray.